Good morning, colleagues. Welcome back for uh, the final day session in the uh, Edinburgh International Culture Summit. It's nice to see you all. I hope you enjoyed last night's performances. Um, we've got some more this morning. And in fact, we're going to begin this session. Uh, I'm going to introduce David Leventhal, Programme Director and Founding Teacher of the Mark Morris Group for Dance Parkinson's Disease Programme, and Prince Toto Nuenshuti, uh, multidisciplinary artist, dancer, and scholar from South Africa, to speak and perform. And in fact, some delegates may remember uh, David Leventhal from the Cultural Summit in 2016, where he had us all um, performing dance from the podium and from the seats. So, uh, but I'm going to hand over now, if I can, to David and Prince Toto. And that name, where they used to be milking your name, where they used to be work, poverty and danger on earth. You saw you people losing humanity, evil of a lot of conscience and made it empty. Babies became adults before maturity. Full of orphans, widows, and prisoners, the one Eve of love in your culture. But nothing was done to stop the fire. So cold, enlightened, and science destroyed you instead of saving God. Are you ready? Are you ready? Hey, 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 oh yeah. Yangarizubunga <laughs> Kwezi <laughs> Nyabawe <laughs> Abakura bari baba hivi bikuda cha Muti manamu riba gira nurazima Ubu hanga bagabi hiti nore niniti Ura dutaba huku dutaba Raiwe Ahanga iwe Wanda Oya Oya Nibi kongere Angari zubume na mahoro Teri mbere Rebero <laughs> Banya kwe kubira, ibirguara ninzara Akabuza, mbere hawe ni heza Ahangangai we, hey, hey, hey Wanda, uya Uya, nibi kongere Angari zume na mahoro, teri mbere, uwele bero kingero Ama somo na masoku ya niri 
Sakara Furika no Kwisi Ah 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 ngai we hey 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 Oya mi go ngere Come zu twa zu da ugarwanda twese tugusigasire twikire zikwanda Angari su muri mano rukundo gwanye kwikubira ibirwara ninzara akabuza mere hawe ni heza Ah Nakauza imbere hawe ni heza Asezi ye humba sabaye mwewe Nakauza imbere hawe ni heza Kuitabi imuruza Nakauza imbere hawe ni heza Yeko Imbere hawe ni heza More, 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 warara, more, 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 we, more, warara, more, 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 warara, more, 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 we, more, warara. More, more, we, more, warare. More, 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 we, more, warare. More, 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 warare. More, 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 we, more, warare. Can you sing with me? More, 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 wararai. More, 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 wararai. Here we go. More, 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 wararai. More, 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 wararai. I sing first, and then you repeat after me, right? More, 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 wararaye. More, 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 wararaye. More, 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 wararaye. More, 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 more. More, more, we, more, wararai. More, 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 wararai. More, 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 wararai. 
Thank you. It's always hard to transition out of performance into conversation, but that's what we're going to do. So uh, we have a brief time together, and we're going to try to share as many different things as we can. I think my first question is, for Toto, what's so special or powerful about the absence of words, which is what dance is most notably to a, to a first time viewer is about. There are no words, and yet there's a lot of meaning. Why is that important? It's so important, especially for me as a genocide survivor and many survivors, and not just genocide survivor, but survivor of any crime or any unspeakable violence. I think we know what happens when, uh, with violence against women or children or different abusers or different diseases. So when you, you're dealing with something you cannot express in words. And that's where I find dance so powerful, movement, because it, it goes deep at the heart of our souls, at the heart of our being. It connects us with ourselves, with nature, with other people in ways that are beyond what can ever be expressed in words. Uh, that's why I find movement and dancing so powerful, or even any other medium of art and expression. Yeah. We were talking the other day about intuition, and the intuition of the body. And you talked about a point in your in your escaping, because there were a number of years where you felt like you were constantly escaping, um, where you had to make a choice. Can you tell us that story briefly, and then what that taught you about physical intuition and why that's important? Mm -hmm. um, embodied intuition, physical intuition, um, embodied knowledge, yeah, so many words people use, I, I would say, kind of a wisdom, an embodied wisdom. Again, something you know that, but you cannot put in words. <laughs> and um, so this is a long story, but very, very briefly. There was many moments during genocide in 1994. So in 90, they started war. For those who know the Rwandan story, in 90, there's a, a war uh, in Rwanda, and then four years from 90 until 94, we had a period of uh, huge propaganda, hate propaganda, hate speech. The tension were <laughs> rising a lot in the country. And in 94, after the plane of the former president was shot down, the whole country really started burning. Uh, people we knew as neighbors and friends starting uh, chasing us, wanting to kill us. We go into hiding and uh, in that hiding, we, we didn't know if we were going to leave uh, the next day. And uh, I survived because of someone who, who saved me and my family. But we, when we left the hospital, we were hiding in a mental hospital, and the hospital in Dera was completely destroyed on the 17th of April. And thousands of people died there, including my father. And when we left, that building in ruins, and we started walking, hiding from places to places, from forest to uh, people's friends and uh, families. We reached a point where in, in one forest, we, we reached a crossroads, and we didn't know which way to go. Do we go left or do we go right? And Majority of people I was with were uh, women and children and the younger people like me. And when you have been to school, and I was just a high school student, I was very uh, young then, but they seemed to trust me that I know I can help them go somewhere, I can be their leader, but I really didn't know what to do. But in, when we reached that crossroads, I couldn't make a choice, and I was afraid if I make a choice and then we die, I'll put people in danger. And for the first time, we never argued, we never discussed like this before, but at that moment, people start arguing, where do we go? Do we go right or left? 
And so in that dilemma, I called on a child. Her name was Ikeza, and she was about like six, seven years old. I said, Ikeza, where would you like to go? And she pointed the direction without thinking immediately, and we ran that direction. Some people went to the other direction, the opposite way. But after like three hours of walking and running, and we sat down, and other people who took the other way came back running to us. Some of them were bleeding, uh, injured, and I don't know what happened that moment, but the, that child saved us because that instinct and that intuition. And later at night when we were, because most of the time during the night that we, we had the chance to rest and sleep because the militia were drinking or they went back home waiting to come back tomorrow to continue killing. So late at night, one of the young people I was with got a high fever and he was very hot, uh, trembling and shivering. And so, again, I quickly told everyone to help me. I started digging in the soil, uh, using uh, the leaves. We covered him with the soil and the leaves until here in the neck. Early in the morning, around four or five, the fever was broken. He stood up, and we continued running and working. Yeah. Again, that is the kind of there is an embodied knowledge of instinct and intuition, but there's also uh, bringing up, growing up in a family of people who are medical doctors and nurses and uh, being in a space where I was listening and looking what my parents were doing. I know when I was a child, I had the fever, my mom would bring like a, a very uh, water and cold oh. clothes and it would put on my head and warm me up. Uh, there's many ways we use the soil uh, to heal ourselves. So in the forest, I guess, I had that kind of embodied knowledge mm. I had already internalized that I used to help that young, uh, young boy, mm. and it saved him. So, and many times when the soldiers or the militia were shooting in the hospital, for instance, throwing grenades and bombs and killing, People were dying all around us, and moving quickly was saving your life. And you didn't know if I move, what was going to happen, but many times I would run, I would move, and immediately the spot where you just left, a bomb hit there, a grenade hits there, people die there. And my mother and my young sisters were very, very small then. Sometimes they, they ask me, what made you move? How did you know when you reached that roadblock that these people were going to kill us and you, you, you made us turn around and everybody who were behind us were killed? How did you know that? I said, I didn't know just that instinct and intuition I cannot put in words. And when I'm dancing or performing or creating work with people, it's that kind of knowledge and wisdom and instinct, I'm trying to help people feel or get in touch with it. Because I know all of us have that capacity of being in touch with that. We all have that. It's interesting that you say that because, you know, there, there are overlaps, certainly a very different situation when we're talking about a chronic disease like Parkinson's. We're not talking about war, trauma, and genocide. but some of that overlap of finding an embodied knowledge of, of understanding your body and your movement in a different way than has been um, described or prescribed um, is, is, a, is a parallel. So I'm, I'm thinking of one of our participants, some of you saw if you were here in 2016, uh, Cindy Gilbertson uh, in her living room talks about this feeling of even when she can't walk, she can dance, she can, she can source the knowledge of dance movement, of being a dancer, to initiate movement and to control movement that otherwise is so difficult for her. There's something about that connection to, to movement as, as um, intuitive knowledge, but also movement as artful knowledge, that there's, there's a consciousness to it, there's decision-making. Sometimes that decision-making, or often that decision-making is nonverbal. 
I'm not saying I'm making a choice to do that. There's something, it's about a feeling, it's a sensory part. And that's, that's where I think there's that overlap. I would also say that there's this uh, theme of resilience that in, in both of our fields, in our areas of work, yeah. we're using dance as a way to generate not just an embodied knowledge, but a resilience that regardless of what the circumstances have been, no matter how challenging they have been, no matter how um, degrading they have been, the act of moving together, of dancing together, uh, provides an uplift. It provides a sense of confidence. It provides a language to reconnect with one's own body and maybe with one's own people in this way. So that resilience and community are very much tied together in any kind of community dance form. I think we're trying to build resilience through community and build community through resilience. Does that sound like a working model that we can be comfortable with? Completely. <laughs> <laughs> Completely, I agree. Um, and I would like to add that um, uh, not far from here, I think in Abidin, um, there's a professor I admire very much, uh, Professor Timothy Ingold. And he, he, he talks a lot about uh, this embodied knowledge and knowing and learning and really trying to challenge these uh, rigid, fixed forms of learning in classrooms, universities, and places, and uh, using art, performance, music, or other experiential approaches to help us learn and tap into uh, 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 who we are, but also creating or making knowledge. And for me, um, those experiential approaches, art forms, uh, community dancing, singing together. I think there are many experts here who are more knowledgeable than me in, in, in neuroscience and neurologists and other science who say and prove that something we do together, singing together, dancing together, has so much benefit, so much impact on our brain, uh, our body, our emotional and psychological being. And I would say that for many years, uh, before industrialization, before enlightenment, our communities did that. Yeah, in yes. connection with nature, with each, each other. We moved, we danced. We, we didn't give these names we put to today, <laughs> but they knew because they felt it. They knew because they lived it daily, constantly together. And bonding was something essential to survive made thousands of years ago, we know that. And to create that bonding, that connection, they use movement, different rituals, different community-oriented uh, activities. And today, I think we have a huge resource we can tap into. And if I may respond to one of the speakers who spoke earlier, Joshua, uh, saying we are in a difficult time today, and time of technology and uh, artificial intelligence and there's a distribution of power, but at the same time we see a concentration of power on the other hand, and there seem to be a kind of tension and contradiction. What do we do? This huge power being concentrated on one side and this other side, a distribution of freedom of information going on. And as he said, throughout the years in evolution. We had the moment of great change and unfortunately they were followed by also wars and conflict and what do we do? I would suggest that dance maybe is a, our next stand or maybe our last stand or movement, embodied wisdom and knowledge and connecting and bonding as a people beyond any form, beyond any religion or science or whatever because dance moving Singing has that capacity to go beyond any barrier, any discrimination, whatever I may use. And so for me, I just, yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. Can I just say that uh, my intuition tells me we need to move on to the next item here. So yeah, okay. can I just say thank you very much. <laughs> it was a lovely way to start our morning. And I thank you both for the contribution you've made already to uh, our summit. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We now can continue uh, this morning's presentation, starting with Dr. Asal Habibi, 
Assistant Research Professor from the Brain and Creativity Institute, the University of Southern California, who will talk on the creative brain and her work as a neuroscientist. Good morning, everybody. Um, my sincere thanks to the presiding officers, distinguished guests, and Sir Jonathan Mills for the invitation, and the incredible team that has organized our three days here together. Uh, I have really enjoyed the presentations. Thank you for the beautiful performance, Toto and David, this morning. And I'm honored to be part of the discussion today on culture and well-being. I am here today to share with you some of the scientific evidence, especially from the perspective of neuroscience, psychology, and education, on why every child, regardless of socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, or nationality, should have access to quality arts education. Today, I'm going to focus my remarks on music education, because that's my area of expertise. However, given everything that we know about brain and development, what I say today applies equally to dance, to visual arts, and theater. I want to first make it clear that irrespective of research findings that I will share with you today, I consider music and arts as essential components of childhood education. We don't have to justify music's place in our education system solely based on research findings related to its extra musical benefits, such as on language, on um, intelligence, and on maturation of the brain. However, I believe that um, neuroscience research in this area has greatly developed and benefits of music education on the brain and behavior are becoming increasingly more evident. So educators, administrators, and policymakers who are often faced with making difficult decisions about school curriculum and activities, especially at times of limited budgets, need to have the most up-to-date information to make informed decisions about the place of music and arts in school. So what are some of the benefits of music? We know that experience shapes the brain. This includes the creation of new connections and facilitation of communication between neurons or brain cells, a process that we call myelination. Neuroscience research shows that infants as young as nine months old, when exposed to music, can have, show enhanced brain responses to changes of pitch and rhythm meaning they notice when something doesn't sound right. And not only in music, but patterns of speech as well, meaning like which syllable belongs to which word. That is, exposure to music does not only help their musicality, but also helps their language development. We also have evidence that music exposure can help infants perceive and recognize emotions in human voice, including sadness, fear, anger, and happiness. This leads to more successful communication and interaction with family members and caregivers. Moving beyond infancy to childhood and the experience of music making itself. We now have clear evidence that learning and performing music engages and activates many areas and systems of the brain. Consider some of the steps involved in playing a musical instrument. Reading a music score consisting of abstract symbols and having to translate them into meaningful sound by adjusting fine finger movement on an instrument. Listening and making necessary adjustments while evaluating the performance. Learning and remembering the nuances of a piece and often playing an entire piece from memory. In addition, in ensemble playing, every musician has to attend to his or her own performance while coordinating with others. Through neuroimaging techniques, including magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, and electroencephalography, or EEG, we cannot um, identify the brain systems that are involved in this orchestration. They are the sensory and perceptual system, uh, involved in tactile, visual, and auditory perception, the cognitive and executive function system, involved in planning, attention, and decision-making, the motor system that coordinates fine and gross motor action, the reward and pleasure system, and the learning and memory system. In short, making music actively engages many major systems of the brain, and there is good evidence that it increases brain capacity through neuroplasticity. In other words, music shapes the brain by making new connections and increasing the strength of existing connections between the neurons. What are some of the specific findings on the benefits of music making? Let me start with more obvious ones. Learning and performing music during childhood improves listening skills by tapping into the plasticity of the brain regions that process sound information, including the auditory cortices. 
One important feature of better listening that has been shown to improve with music training is the ability to detect relevant sound amidst noise. For example, when there is ambient noise in a classroom, children who have had music training can perceive the relevant information and instruction more successfully. This is very important for all children throughout the world who live in noisy environments. From a neuroanatomical perspective, brain regions involved in sound processing, such as the primary auditory cortex, and brain regions involved in sound motor integration, such as the inferior frontal gyrus, have been shown to be anatomically enhanced in trained musicians. And differences are even more pronounced in musicians who started training during childhood. If these were the only findings, the implications would be truly significant. But there are many benefits beyond auditory processing. Let me give you a few examples. We have strong evidence that music training in childhood facilitates language learning, reading readiness, and general intellectual development. We have evidence that it can foster a positive attitude and mindset and ensures that children at every stage of development are able to understand that effort and discipline can lead to success. It is also true that learning to play music enhances creativity and promotes prosocial behavior. Let me now give you some specific examples from a five-year longitudinal study that my colleagues and I at the Brain and Creativity Institute at University of Southern California have been conducting in collaboration with the Los Angeles Philharmonic and their youth orchestra program, YOLA. We have been tracking how participation in this music program impacts the brain, cognitive, and social development, and overall well-being and success of its participants. We compared a group of children ages six to seven from the program with children who did not have access to music or any enrichment program. When the study began five years ago, the children were no different from each other in any of the brain measures or the measures of social, emotional, or cognitive. But after just two years of music training, we began to see significant differences. Children in the music program not only became better musically, but they also show more mature brain auditory pathways, meaning they are better at processing all kinds of sounds. They also show significantly more improvement in executive function and social skills compared to children who did not have music training. We also observed that children in the music group had more robust connectivity between their right side and left side of their brain. I want to take a moment to consider the implication of what I just said. Stronger connections between the two hemispheres of the brain can facilitate communication and integration of information across the entire brain. This can potentially give a child an advantage when it comes to synthesis of information as well as to creativity. And this change in the actual anatomy of the brain was observable after just two years of music training. I want to leave you with a story of one of the students in our study. A student who I call Daniela comes from a family of six. She lives with her parents, sibling and grandparents in a small two bedroom apartment in the Rampart District neighborhood in Los Angeles the country's second most densely populated neighborhood that is affected by extreme poverty, gang violence, and drug trafficking. Her parents are hardworking immigrants who spend 10 to 12 hours a day on cleaning and construction jobs. And their demanding work schedule does not leave time for cultural activity or social interaction and learning with their children. At the same time, they cannot afford to send their children to after school programs, and her public school does not offer any arts or music programming. In 2012, she was selected to enroll in YOLA, a community youth orchestra sponsored by the Los Angeles Philharmonic that provides free music training and instruments to children from underserved communities of Los Angeles. Now, after five years of participation in this program, not only has she become a skilled young musician, but she recently spoke to me about how through her music training, she has learned how, how a complex skill is developed through effort and mindful practice and discipline. She's a significantly better student at her school. She's more compassionate and empathic towards her family and friends. And most of all, she has gained self-confidence and believes in her natural abilities. She recently told me that she has committed herself to become a physician to help her community, but also plans to continue playing the violin to maintain art and music as part of her life. 
we all agree that our greatest resource for the future is the potential intellectual, creative, and social capacity of our children. Those of us in this room are tasked with the responsibility to support development of these capacities through all available means. And I'm excited that we now have compelling evidence from neuroscience to support what we already intuitively know, that music and arts can play an important role in helping children to become successful, creative, and caring individuals. I appreciate the opportunity to share this work with you and admire all the work you're all doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Habibi. Uh, and now our next speaker for the session is going to be uh, Professor Baz Bloom, Director and Consultant Neurologist from Rabdu University Medical Centre in the Netherlands. And Professor Bloom works with brain diseases and malfunctions disorders, including Parkinson's disease. I'll pass over to oh, Baz. Thank you. Let's see if the microphone works. Um, and I have slides. I can start by saying that it's a tremendous honor and a pleasure to be here with you. I'm a medical doctor, and this is a typical physician in the Netherlands. <laughs> typical grassy field, the lowlands, and at first sight, this world of medicine could not be more different from the world of culture and the world of art. Another piece of magnificent art from the Netherlands that requires no further introduction. In the next 10 minutes or so, my task is to tell you that these two worlds, the world of medicine and the world of art and culture, are not only closely intertwined, they are in fact inseparable. And for me as a neurologist, specialized in one particular condition called Parkinson's disease, it is really fascinating to see how the brain has created one molecule that binds these two worlds together. And that molecule is called dopamine. If you have a lack of dopamine, it causes a neurological condition called Parkinson's disease. If you have lots of dopamine, it makes you creative, and it helps you to produce art and contribute to culture. And it's all bound together by one molecule. And for those of you who do not know what Parkinson's disease is, this is one of my patients. Here you see the characteristic tremor, which I think most people equate with Parkinson's. It's an asymmetric disease for reasons we don't fully understand. There is slowness and clumsiness of the movements, which you can nicely see in this tapping score. The movements start okay, we'll come to that later in a minute, but the movements become smaller and smaller as he tries to continue to maintain these movements. And another debilitating feature of the disease is the impairment of gait and balance, as shown here in this video. What is so fascinating is that you can correct the lack of dopamine with medication. And there is now some very good scientific evidence of patients with Parkinson's disease who had never been artists before in their life, who have been treated with dopamine, who now become artists. And really beautiful art. You see painting. So this lady had never been a painter. Developed Parkinson's, got drugs, and now becomes a painter. A sculptor, a photographer. And you would agree with me that this is beautiful art. But sometimes, Dopamine can take its own course, and when it works too much, creativity and addiction are very closely related. And this is an example of one of my patients, again with Parkinson's disease, who was treated with dopaminergic medication, but now became addicted to memorizing telephone books. But again, he used art to counter this. And he made, I think this is a stunning painting, where he used the telephone book pages, and he said, who am I? And just bear with me, if a chemical substance which you take as a drug changes you as a human being and a personality, I think this question is compelling, who am I, if a drug changes my total being? So I'm just going to illustrate a few ways of how medicine and culture are closely intertwined. One is art as a diagnostic tool. There is now good scientific evidence that by analyzing paintings, you can have an early detecting, detection of neurological diseases. Salvador Dali had Parkinson's disease. Each artist has their own, what they call, signature. And the signature is what characterizes you as an artist. 
And it gets better and better throughout life as the artist matures. But if it goes down on a steep slope, it could be an early sign of disease. We know that you can diagnose Alzheimer's disease from paintings. And this is how you can change how the artistic expressions of Salvador Dali changed and going from what you see on the left to the more structured, more typical lack of dopamine type of paintings on the right. And the signature already reveals what later became Parkinson's disease. Another compelling example is this man called Julian Herman. He is the concertmaster, the former concertmaster of the Netherlands Philharmonic Orchestra and a wonderful, wonderful man, but more about that later. He noticed in his violin play that his Parkinson's disease was hampering his performance. And I brought a video to, so you can hear it. So you can hear how he starts off in a magnificent way, but you see the performance decline over time. And remember the tapping scores in the Parkinson patient? You can hear the signature sign of Parkinson's better than a neurologist can tell you by looking at the motor symptoms. And in fact, when we asked another violinist, an elite violinist, to analyze his play, you can see there are hardly any errors in the beginning, the red bars, but they progress over time. And when we analyzed the sound of his performance quantitatively, this is the typical decrement. And now we've started a whole new project about hearing and listening to Parkinson's disease, but inspired by art. And you may have seen this film, if you haven't, I highly recommend it, A Late Quartet, where Christopher Walken plays the mentor cellist of a string quartet in, in, in New York, where he develops Parkinson's disease and his fellow Musicians notice that there's something wrong. They say our vibrato doesn't match. And it's the earliest sign of what later becomes Parkinson's before a neurologist had noticed. Now, what about art and medicine as culture? We've heard about David Leventhal's compelling story about how he uses music in a wonderful way and dance as a treatment. There's an ex another example. This is Mr. Siebold Hulsberger, one other patient of mine who's got Parkinson's disease. And he's made this painting which is already, it looks nice, it's gold on blue, and I like those two colors. But in fact, in this brain, it's, the, it's a picture of the brain, embedded is portions of the brain serving particular functions. So there is actually a little ballet dancer in precisely the area of the brain that subserves movement and coordination. And the whole painting is built, it's, it's on YouTube, you can see it, and it's really brilliant. This is another patient of mine, and a, She's got a terrible disease called myoclonus. You see these jerks that interrupt all of her movements. And she's truly debilitated. She's in a wheelchair. But she, but she made this painting for me where she abused, exploited her myoclonic jerks to create a painting. And every time I see this, it gives me the goosebumps. And she made this painting for me that's now in my office where she used her disease to produce art, which I think is incredible. And just an, one other one is this man with Parkinson's disease um, um, who is unable to walk. He's from India. And we know that patients with Parkinson's disease have a deficit in the automatic pilot in the brain. So anything that needs to go automatically is awry. But when people, for example, try to climb stairs, they can walk. They can compensate for their disease. Now, this man climbs stairs every day. But as you know, there are no staircases everywhere in your house. And now his niece, who is a designer and an artist, created the three-dimensional illusion of a staircase on the floor, allowing him to walk. And now she's painted these three-dimensional staircases throughout the house. And in fact, she is now giving away for free three-dimensional carpets to people with Parkinson's around the world. The only thing she wants in return is not money, but a video of how well the patient has improved. And just finally in this little section, this is fresh, nobody's seen this. We've got two papers out where we looked at patients with Parkinson's and looked at the job they chose as a 21-year-old uh, at a young age. And as it turns out, if you as a 20-year-old 
choose to become a bookkeeper or an accountant, you're at risk, slightly at risk of developing Parkinson's. But if you choose to become an artist at a young age, you're protected <laughs> against Parkinson's. This paper just came out. You're the first one to hear it. So my point is, medicine and culture are inseparable worlds. And they are like Romeo and Juliet, a couple, a love couple for life. And I can see how in times of crisis, and there are many challenges ahead of us, it is very easy to close a museum or to cut your budget on an orchestra. But I think you harm the population's health by saving on culture. And in fact, my very point is that the world of culture and the world of arts should maybe lead the world of medicine. Because artists, by definition, are free thinkers. Whereas the world of medicine is by nature much more conservative. If anybody is in crisis, it is the medical world. We published this paper in the Movement Disorders Journal where we said we could not have designed healthcare worse. It's, it's totally wrong. And healthcare costs are mounting, so we need new models of care. And I think artists can help us. And just in closing, I will give you three very brief examples of how I see where art and culture could help the world of medicine. One is I visited Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic on the 35th floor, it's one of the largest clinics in the United States, has architects observing doctors as if they were anthropologists and looking at our behavior as doctors and then make suggestions how to improve care. Another example is Sir William Osler. He was the founder of Johns Hopkins Hospital in the United States. And he made this statement that there is no more difficult art to acquire than the art of observation. Any doctor knows that it's key to observe. But who is a better observer than an artist? So in our hospital at the Rotbout, we now have a new initiative where doctors and artists together examine art, produce art, so they learn to look like an artist. And they are instructed to draw what you see and not what you think you see, which is very often going wrong in the hands of doctors. And just one example, you know this painting, it's the Potato Eaters by Van Gogh, another beautiful Dutch piece of art. When they asked medical students to look at it, they identified little bits and pieces, funny nose, old woman, but nobody said it's a family eating potatoes. So they zoomed in on the details, but failed to see the overall picture, which is exactly what doctors need to do, is zoom in and zoom out, which is what artists do by nature. And finally, I think this is a beautiful slogan by Pablo Picasso, learn the rules like a pro, so you can break them like an artist. I think medicine and doctors are maybe sometimes too conservative. So this is my final slide, pre-final slide. This is a building in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And it was from the heyday of the Netherlands in the 17th century, our golden century. And it says, the kost gaat voor de baat uit. Colleagues from the Netherlands and Flanders will know what it means. It means when you make an upfront investment, you will reap the benefits later. That's what made Holland great in the 17th century. And I'm asking you and I'm telling you, don't cut on bud your budget on culture and art. Invest. If we invest in culture and art, it will improve and lead to a better population's health. I'm totally convinced. So that's as far as I'm going. And it gives me extreme pride, confidence and joy to announce Mr. Julian Herman. He was in my presentation. Remember the violinist? Julian is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man. He's here today. You've seen his play, and he actually withdrew from public performance because as an artist, his standard was here. And to his mind, his standard was there. With personalized treatment, an occupational therapist looking at his hand position, the medication that I prescribed as a neurologist, we were able to uplift his performance. And although he still thinks that his performance is here, in my humble opinion, he is way up there. And it gives me extreme pleasure. I'm actually asking for your applause for Julian Herman, who's going to do a performance.
Naz and Julian, can I say how utterly wonderful that was, a beautiful performance, heartwarming, moving, brave. I really thank you very much indeed. What a lovely uh, way to contribute to our morning today. Thank you very much, Julian and Baz, for that indeed. And now, follow that. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to ask, if I may, um, for our, our final contributor this morning, um, well, before the ministers, actually, uh, Faisal Abu Alaja, uh, who's a fellow from the Georgetown Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics. Faisal. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> what a view from here. Like, it's kind of a, a great atmosphere, like, after the music, and it really makes it harder for me as somebody I want to talk about laughter and comedy. I hope I will pass it to you nicely. Uh, first, after this uh, nice music, really, I feel I need a group hug with everyone, <laughs> which is good. So, yeah, I'm Faisal, I'm from Palestine, I'm an actor and a, co and a comedian. I would like to thank the Culture Summit for this chance to be here. You can't imagine how much I'm happy of the fact that the clown is speaking in the parliament. <laughs> Something like, I, I appreciate it very much, and I would like to thank also the laboratory uh, for global performance and politics from Georgetown University, the people who uh, put me in touch with the Culture Summit. So, my theme is culture and well-being. And I don't know how to explain to you what I want to explain. Because when I thought about it, it was I was preparing myself, what I should say, I have to be good, oh, it's a parliament, it's so official thing. I wrote a couple of a presentation and then I changed my mind, I throw it all away, I said I will tell the stories. And it's up to you to make it the connection between the well-being or not. So first story I will tell, it's uh, about my friend, Ahmed. Ahmed is a close friend of mine. This story in 2002, during the second intifada in North of West Bank, in Jean refugee camp. During that time was really difficult time. There is a big Israeli attack to our camps. You talk about tanks, Apaches, hundreds of soldiers everywhere. There is a lot of homes being destroyed, more than 370 houses. So it's a big trauma for everyone. And the house of my friend Ahmed, he's been being destroyed also too. So his nickname is Rokh, I, we, we call him. So Rokh was like everybody looking for his mother, for his sister, for his family. But Rokh was researching between the stones, between the stones and he focusing and researching and researching and researching. So all the breasts around, they came around him. Hey, boy, who's there? Your mom said, no. Your father, no. Your what, why you why you're searching for? Said, my PlayStation. <laughs> and all the breasts shh, disappear. Because I, th I think they are, this is not the right story they want to tell in the media. They want more drama. And it was always inspiring for both of us now, like this, this was 2002, we always talk, I always talk with Ahmed about this story. Why, what is, was in your mind during that moment that your home being destroyed and the only thing you care about is your PlayStation? He said, you know, that's after we joined the theater, after we got like a bit educated about art and about comedy. He said, it's make me happy. And it's a way because it's the only PlayStation in the camp, so I can make a friend through this PlayStation. So this PlayStation of Ahmed, it was the state of mind of culture will be. Like he reached this through his PlayStation. Second story I would like to share with you, it's my story in the same year, 2002. By the way, this year, 2002 for West Bank, it was very difficult because the Israeli Prime Minister during that time, Ariel Sharon, launched a big attack to all the cities in West Bank. So um, the soldiers came to our home, to, to the, came to the area, and took everybody out of their places. Like, they have, you have to leave. And when the soldiers say, you have to leave, it means you have to leave. You don't have time even to put your shoes on. You just leave. So I got lucky, I was the only man in my area, because all the men, they were arrested already, and I was 13 years old during that time. So when I went out of the streets, there is tanks, soldiers everywhere, so I just like, you know, in my mind as a child, I felt I'm a Silver, uh, silver uh, Rambo, Silver Vers Stallone, and I'm, I'm, I'm living the action, really, which is was make me like survive my fear a bit. And later on, when we left the camp, 
So I was around with 30, 40 ladies from the camp, and I'm the only boy. We passed a checkpoint. So when in, the, in the checkpoint, when they saw me, like as a young boy, they stopped everyone. Because it's not allowed for you to leave the camp, you have to take your trouser off, and you have to take your shirt up so you can leave. And there is 30 ladies around. So we stopped, guns on me, and yeah, what I should do, they say, take your pants off. Like I had. And now, I'm, in this moment, I freeze. I wasn't afraid, actually, because during that time, I was, as a Palestinian child, I was used to tanks and soldiers, so I'm not afraid. I am shy. And how to convince the ladies that I'm shy, I'm not afraid? Because all of them, because they, we are late, they stop us, the soldier, and 30 ladies are screaming at me, take your trousers off, yalla, come on! <laughs> and how to tell them in this moment that I'm shy? Because I am having a red under underwear. <laughs> and this is the idea of red underwear, it's shy. I couldn't share it, like there is tanks and Apache and all of these around me, but I'm shy of my red underwear, I don't care about what's going on. And then I, you know, I took it and then I passed. After I passed the story, it took me a long time to share this story and to understand what was happening with me during that moment. Because what was happening, it's like, it could happen to everyone, but in different circumstances. But it's a break the stereotype about what fear is. Sometimes we think, we know. We know everything from the media. We read a couple of articles about what's going on in Palestine or Syria or whatever. But who was expecting in that moment, I am shy of my red, my red underwear? And here's my point about the role of clowning and the role of comedy, because it's a way to break our stereotype about many things, about who we are and what we want to be. And also to, to share stories. It's not easy to share a story, guys. It's, that's why I got inspired to be in the hospital as a clown, because these children have a lot of fear of many things, not only the doctors and the nails and, this, uh, and chemotherapy and all of this smell, the medicine, there is more than this. And the clowning in the hospital, it's kind of a, I will not say therapy, because that's a big word, we are not doctors, but I will say, make it easier for them. The same for the families, like I come from a conservative family, a conservative community in general, and conservative family is not a secret. Uh, like when they see the clown, like especially for the ladies, for the women in Palestine, you know, it's forbidden for the tradition, uh, regarding to our traditional rules in some places, it's not easy for a lady to interact with a man, because that's haram, it's not good, it's whatever. But they, but they go like this with the clown. And I'm clearly a man, I'm tall, I'm big, but the only thing is different, I have the red nose. So red, the nose, it's a break the stereotype for the, for the ladies about what is a man mean. And put the man in different concept, which is that what I mean of make it easier. And that's why I believe like clowning and laughter, it's, it's important and more than important to everyone. Because everybody in this room, I believe, have a clown somehow inside of him. But you know, you hide it because you are in the parliament, you want to be cool, you want to be serious, you want to be official. And, uh, yeah, but, everybody, but you are, I look at you all, all these three days, what the clowns I have around me. <laughs> so yeah, last thing I want to I wanna talk about, like last April I've been in touring around the UK with the a great British comedian, Mark Thomas. We, built the, we did the show called Showtime from the Front Line. It's a story about the comedy club in Palestine. The funny thing, like we had a great tour in many places in the world, in, 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 in many places in UK. Inshallah, we'll go to the world soon. One of the things that inspired me, that the difference between the audience. Like example, in the, if there is in the audience like uh, people who is involved with the Palestinian issue, like activists, Politician, all of them, they come to our show. It's a comedy show, huh? remember that? They sit in the first line with a Palestinian kufiya. <laughs> and they never laugh. Because it's Palestine, we can't laugh. It's a freedom. And the people who is not involved in a Palestinian issue or a political issue, 
They laugh. And that was interesting to see how it's comedy. It's, not, it's also a way to communicate. Like, I don't want to be in a stereotype. Okay, you are Palestinian. Ah, okay, you are, you are a victim or a terrorist. That's it. You are done. Khalas. Boom. Go. But we are more than this. More than this. More than this. Not only as a Palestinian. As a human. And that's one of the why I believe in comedy. I believe in clowning, and I believe in jokes. I got inspired by George Orwell when he, when he said, every tiny joke, it's a tiny revolution. So every time, just think about this and remember it. Every time you laugh, you make a revolution inside your body first. And we hear from my colleagues about the art and, uh, and the laughter, and I was just talking with a great uh, professor, sorry, I forget your name. It's like about the power of humor. Some people say laughter is a, a way to survive. Some people say laughter is uh, to hide fear or to despise fear. Some people say laughter is a relief. Some people say laughter is a communication, or it's, it's a way of exp expressing who we are. But for me, I believe we all, as a human, we laugh before we speak, before we talk. And laughter is a reminder for us that we are human and we deserve this life. Thank you very much. Faisal, thank you very much indeed, and thank you for bringing us into our... Oh. <laughs> I'm so, we, we sit next week, I'm so tempted. <laughs> oh, some of my colleagues are... <laughs> <clears throat> if the minister wears one, then perhaps I... Well, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, thank you again, Faisal. Uh, I'm out, uh, the, the great joy of introducing the first of our youth delegates, uh, Nicholas Key from Jamaica, I believe, uh, would like to make a contribution. Nicholas, just for where you're standing, if you're right. Yes, if you stand over there. Thank you. Hi. Good morning, everyone. So, in, uh, I'm going to be speaking about, I guess, uh, Jamaica's perspective first. And in a land of just, uh, in a multicultural land, uh, filled with uh, people of many races, uh, various classes, different identities, um, such as Jamaica, we often take an instinctive approach to how we view um, and activate culture. It's never really quantified. Um, and this happens to be the case for a lot of countries, uh, especially those um, that are also filled with uh, multicultural identities. In Jamaica, we usually operate from a space of scarcity, uh, which is not exactly, um, it, it's polarizing, firstly. Uh, of course, we have our economical challenges, uh, of course, we, have, we tend to have uh, decently high uh, rates of violence. Um, however, we still hold on to our culture. Uh, we have a saying in Jamaica. Um, it's, 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 I'm going to say it and then loosely translate it. It's called um, take, things and make, take things and make it into a joke, which I, I guess loosely translates to uh, making things that are of a, a bad situation into um, that, uh, that, that which is lively and enjoyable. And uh, it's, it really speaks to uh, how we operate. 
And I think on a global scale, uh, even though we all have our challenges, it's important that we pay attention um, really carefully to how we introduce um, culture into, firstly, our schools, um, into the spaces that we, we call safe, and how we use culture to combat um, things like crime and violence. Um, and we have seen successes of, or cases of successes of that in Jamaica. Uh, there are, I'm going to share one example. So there's a program in Jamaica um, run by a nonprofit. I can't exactly remember the name of it, uh, but they essentially rehabilitate uh, criminals. Uh, there was one man in particular, uh, he had spent about 25 years in prison um, for, I, I don't remember the crime either. Um, but while there, he spent his time uh, training to be a musician, uh, a musical artist, that is. And so on leaving prison, he became a recording artist. Um, not sure if you probably remember his name, or probably know his name, but his name is Jack Cure. He spent a few years in prison for um, a, a crime that would possibly alienate him from society. However, on his release, uh, he was entered into the working world as a musician, and now he's able to tour the world, um, to share his story, and to spread um, positive music uh, through the lens of reggae. Reggae has been seen as the dominant force in Jamaica to spread love, positivity, and unity. And I believe um, culture as a whole can do that for all of us. And so as I stand here, I'm imploring to uh, not just my own country, but uh, you all, to really consider the, the effects that introducing culture and, and just investing in culture will have on uh, the people as a whole. Um, for sure, it will increase um, dopamine levels. Um, <laughs> but I, I think when we consider the when we consider quantifying um, things like this, we really need to hone in on uh, how we instinctively feel. We need to bridge that gap uh, between taking uh, the studies that we find uh, to really merging our instinctive reactions to everything that we feel. Um, and I implore you all to do that. Thank you. Nicholas, thank you very much indeed. I'd now like to call a colleague from Singapore, Shafika Ada Salehin. Thank you, presiding officer. A very good morning to everyone. I'm deeply honoured to be here, to be standing before you as the Youth Singaporean Delegate, uh, to offer my response to the messages that have been uh, delivered today and uh, to share with you my perspective and experience as a young artist in Singapore with regard to today's topic, which is uh, culture and well-being. So I am a full-time musician, freelance musician. Uh, I ident identify myself as a composer, a performer, and educator of the arts. So understanding the power of music and the significance of culture is very important at the heart of what I do. It forms a basis of why I do what I do. So for the past two days, uh, it has been really encouraging and empowering and as, as an artist to listen to the shared understanding and commonality that there is, uh, there is importance and value of culture. It is also a humble reminder to me as a young artist that art making is beyond mere self-gratification. That whatever I do as my output as an artist has uh, an, uh, a reach to out, uh, out to a far wider community beyond myself. So knowing all this, um, it reassures me of my purpose and meaning, as, meaning in life as a musician. And I think that this in itself is a statement of the artist's well-being. With all the positive vibes that's going on in this submit, I feel that I'm in a safe and I am in a good time, position and place to be an active contributor 
to the arts and culture. As an artist, I am safe, well, and good. Uh, and moving on, we have heard from Dr. Asad Habibi about the ha benefits of music, and I would like to share with you uh, a personal experience in which I saw the positive impact of music happen before my very eyes. In Singapore, one of the most meaningful work that I've had the opportunity to do was to perform as a roving mu musician in a hospital. I play the accordion, and together with two other musician friends of mine, we performed for the patients who were warded there, and we moved from ward to ward, performing several songs that uh, would remind them of their past or uh, would uh, entertain them. It was a very fulfilling experience for me, and I clearly remember uh, I was playing for an elderly lady who was clearly a bit ridden. She was uh, very ill, and I was asked to perform a traditional song for her, so which, in which I did. And well, while I was performing, I was very uh, surprised to see her smiling, and she was humming to the song that I was performing. She was moving her head. And after finishing that song, her daughter came up to me and she said, thank you for that performance, because she had not seen her mother smile, and um, because the, the mother was constantly in pain. And I, was, I felt so honored to be able to make that kind of impact um, to her mother. So this experience for me truly proved the power and magic of music in getting through to someone to bring about human emotions. The culture and the arts should be accessible to all people, people with disabilities, in palliative care, or have terminal illnesses, and uh, because they have as much right to enjoy the arts as the others. For a person with a terminal illness, for example, I think that the very act of bringing culture to that person is to dignify him and to make him feel validated as a human being. Singapore is becoming increasingly aware of this, and we have the example of hospitals in partnerships with our performing arts uh, centre, Esplanade, that enables the running of such programmes with local artists. One other aspect of culture and well-being that I'd like to share from my perspective is the function of culture to bring people together, which then promotes the well-being of a nation as a whole. So as you might understand, Singapore has a multi-religious multi -religious and multi-ethnic society. Um, but as a young nation of 53 years, uh, a unique Singaporean culture is increasingly em emerging and perceived. In solidarity with my fellow Singaporeans, um, I have an affinity with our, our English, colloquial English called Singlish. Uh, and we enjoy our food, which um, which celebrates the coming together of different cultures. It seems that things that make us Singaporean brings us together and forge a common understanding between one another. So just an example, just two weeks ago, Singapore celebrated its 53rd birthday. And to commemorate that, the Singapore Symphony Orchestra programmed a very special National Day concert that featured a multi-generation of Singaporean composers. This is really the first of its kind. And amongst the works of my contemporaries and sen senior composers, my own orchestral work was performed in this concert mm -hmm. under the baton of uh, our renowned uh, Singaporean conductor, Daryl Ang. The orchestra also performed national songs that speak to the hearts of every Singaporean. And as a result, the concert actually received a full house attendance and it was even broadcasted live on Facebook so that netizens Singaporeans and non-Singaporeans alike could enjoy that concert. I think this is groundbreaking because it provided people who have not seen an orchestra before to have that opportunity to do so. For example, my, my own parents, it's the very first time that they actually saw a, an orchestra perform live. And to have this performance, I think it creates a sense of ownership and uh, connection to the orchestra because any Singaporean who was able to see that performance can have a sense of connection to the songs that were being uh, performed and uh, looking at the artists that were being featured in that concert, they have that connection to see that, oh, this is my people, uh, this is what Singaporeans can do as a whole. 
And therefore, the concert is a nod towards validating the nation's emerging uh, as well as uh, accomplished composers in the field of class classical music. And I think that this continued culture of celebration of Singapore's born and bred and what makes us Singaporean can increase the sense of pride and of your people and their home, thus fostering the collective well-being of a na nation. So I've given my perspective, my Sing Singaporean perspective of how culture promotes well-being in an individual and collectively as a nation. And I hope that you can take some of these points to your country as well. And lastly, I would like to say that as much as culture contributes to the well-being of people, let us not forget that the well-being of the people who contributes to culture, that is, artists themselves, should not be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shafika. Now that brings us to an end of the morning session. Uh, I would just encourage members, if they wish to, to join in on the social media debate. There's some fairly lively comments, some challenging comments about freedom of expression and allowing uh, dissent and some not entirely supportive comments about funding for the arts. So maybe you need to get in there and uh, challenge some of those remarks. Um, before I, ha I uh, hand over, before you go into your workshops, um, looking ahead this afternoon, I'm very aware that a number of, particularly of ministerial delegates, would like to make a contribution. And uh, to be honest, speaking entirely selfishly as an elected representative, I know how important it is that ministers are able to make a little contribution in the plenary. However, we've got up to a dozen people wish to speak already. So I'm sure you can do the maths. You cannot give a speech if you all want to contribute. So can I suggest that if you make a few remarks of maybe three minutes, maybe four at the top, then I'll try and get as many people in as possible and it'll be more participative because we, I'd like it to be more partic participative. So with that admonition and encouragement, three minute speeches, um, I look forward to seeing you this afternoon. I'm going to hand over, if I can, to Joanne Kendall, who will uh, tell you where to go next. <laughs>